This is our sixth and last session, I think, on Ephesians 5, 3 through 7. It will be a whirlwind of many texts, but let me set the stage here. Sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness are not even to be named among you as is proper among saints, and shamefulness and foolish talk and crude joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For be sure of this, that every sexually immoral one, or impure one, or covetous one, that is an idolater, does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, which will mean that they will not inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Father, I pray that you would help us understand how the warnings about wrath fit with justification by faith alone. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sons of disobedience. Wrath comes upon them. Where have we seen that before? Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So the devil is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, this is not a select group of people, this is all of us, the rest of mankind, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So we are children of wrath. That is, wrath will be natural to us because disobedience is natural to us. To be a son of disobedience and a child of wrath go together. We are children of wrath because we are sons of disobedience. Disobedience is our very nature, therefore wrath will belong to us as if it was our parent. So this wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And it's coming because of these things, because of these things, namely It's coming upon sexually immoral people and impure people and covetous people. And he is saying this to warn the church that we not even let it be named among us, because this will happen to us if we let it be named among us and it takes root and ruins us. Now, what then are these empty words? What are they trying to deceive us of? Let no one deceive you, because wrath really is coming. So evidently, these words are empty of biblical truth, and the attempt is to deceive you and persuade you there is no wrath of God coming. And that might be because they don't believe God is a wrathful God. And it might be because they believe you've been sealed for the day of redemption. And there's no point in you taking any heed here because there's no wrath coming upon you. Wrath isn't possible. He shouldn't be threatening Christians with this kind of wrath since we are sealed. Now, how does then this warning to Christians fit with? justification by faith, for we are justified by faith alone. That's plain. It's plain right here in Ephesians. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. So maybe the person is trying to deceive you by saying, oh, look, there it is. You are saved through faith, by grace. It is not owing to any works of yours. Therefore, it is vain for Paul 
to warn you about being sexually immoral and impure and covetous because those things do not wreck your future because you're saved by faith. If you're found in bed with a prostitute when the Lord comes, you'll be saved. I heard a man say that one time. This is Paul saying, no, don't think that way. Take heed. Well, are we or are we not justified by faith? For we hold that one is justified by faith, Romans 3.28, apart from works of the law. We're not saved or justified on the basis of staying sexually pure. Or Romans 5.1, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, by faith, by faith. So, this deceiver here, this empty talker, is arguing that you don't need to even think about wrath. You shouldn't let threats of wrath uh, come into your mind, and Paul shouldn't be talking this way. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that there is no holiness or no heaven without holiness. For example, Romans 8, 12, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to live according to the flesh. We, we, we Christians are not debtors to live according to the flesh, for if you, you Christian, live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body are the sons of God. And if you don't, you prove yourself to be not the Son of God. This is why we need to hear these kinds of warnings, because we may prove ourselves to be not the Son of God because we're not led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Or, here's James 2.17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. If there are no works, your faith is not real. Or 1 John 2, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You don't know God if you're not keeping the commandments of God. But here's the reality. God keeps his own. God secures his own. God saves his own by keeping them holy. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. We are guaranteed salvation by the Lord through faith alone. That is, we get into favor with God through faith alone. And in Christ, we are then saved through sanctification. He doesn't do an end run around sanctification and say it doesn't matter. The sanctification is built on your justification by faith alone. But if it's not there, the justification is unreal. The faith is unreal. Here it is in Romans 8.30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. That means he brought them to faith and justified them. And those whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, between justification and glorification, nobody falls out. Predestination leads in God's sovereignty to being called. Being called leads in God's sovereignty to being justified. Being justified leads in God's sovereignty through sanctification to glorification, and nobody who is truly justified fails to be glorified because God saves them through sanctification. Even back here in Ephesians 1, we saw it. In Him, you also. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance 
until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we come back here now one more time to look at the argument. Don't let any sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness be named among you because the sexually immoral, the impure, and the covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. And yet we just were told that those who are truly saved do have an inheritance and they are sealed and kept for that inheritance. Indeed they are. God preserves his own. Nevertheless, it would be a deceptive and empty word if somebody says to you, therefore, you don't need to listen to Paul's warnings about the wrath of God. Oh, yes, we do. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, God, by the Spirit, uses this warning, uses it to keep us from being immoral, impure, and covetous. We've seen it before, we see it now again, and we will continue to see it. God justifies us by faith alone. Yes, he does. And God guarantees that those who are justified will be glorified. And he guarantees it and does it by the sealing. And the sealing is by the Spirit. And the Spirit sanctifies us and works this holiness in us.